Jesus Christ. Amen. So in Leviticus, or um, in Leviticus 1, it starts off, this is just a cool little thing. Um, it starts off by saying, and God spoke to Moses from outside the tent. And then all Leviticus that Jonathan has been preaching on leads up to Numbers. And the first verse I'm going to read, and this isn't where we're going to stay today, but it's just a cool little precursor. It says, and then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of the meeting on the first day of the month in the second year after they had come out of Egypt, saying, take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel by clans, by the father's house, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the point is, so in Leviticus, I didn't just blah, blah, blah the word of God, but <laughs> my wife gave me a look like, you can't do that, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the point is, is in Leviticus, God is speaking to Moses from outside the tent, and now he's speaking to Moses inside the tent. That relationship, that intimacy is happening. The presence of God is happening in a bigger way. They have started to apply all the things they learn about Leviticus and the law and all these things to draw near to God and have God near, draw near to them, and it's happening. If you're an accountant here today, Jim, one of our board members is actually here today, you get really excited by that first verse, that we want you to do a census and count all the people. And you could start to read numbers and just check out. You're like, oh my gosh, I do not want to read about how many people were in each tribe and blah, blah, blah. Um, maybe if you're an accountant, that excites you. But if you're me, it's not the most fascinating thing that happens in the first chapter or so. But in numbers... Just like all of the Word of God, there are some fascinating stories and a lot that we can glean from and understand. Numbers follows the um, cycle that Jonathan has been teaching you through. We're going to put it up. You know, it's the same cycle that's seen throughout all of Scripture, throughout all the Old Testament, and it's found in Numbers time and time again. Numbers, there's a lot of things that happen. Aaron dies during Numbers. The people complain against God and grumble a lot. Numbers was, is actually the title, the Greek title for the book. The Hebrew title for the book is In the Wilderness. This is the 40 years of the people wandering around in the wilderness, and most of them know they're going to die in the wilderness because God said, you're not going into the promised land. You're going to wander around, and we'll let your children go into the promised land. So they're walking around knowing they're going to die in the wilderness, and God is starting to establish his presence. But as you can imagine, that's a tough situation to be in, right? They're just wandering around the wilderness, and there's a lot of bickering and complaining that starts happening. And that's kind of where I want to focus today because I think the bickering and complaining is actually very much in keeping and indicative to everything we've looked at in this cycle. So one, so just to give you a recap, um, Miriam complains against Moses. And what happens to Miriam? She gets struck with leprosy. She's talking to Aaron and Moses pleads on her behalf and God heals her of the leprosy. Um, Aaron dies. All the people are complaining against God who has, think about this. These are the people that saw the plagues. These are the people that walked through the sea on dry land. These are the people that saw the pillar of fire. These are the people that saw Moses come down from the mountain. These are the people that got the word of God, the pillar of smoke, the fire, the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke, God's presence in the camp. And they're still complaining and grumbling against God. And where we're going to focus today is actually in chapter 21. There's a short story that I think kind of sums up the entire book and has something that we can really glean from and take away today. And um, that's where we're going to be for right now. So with verse 4, starting in chapter 21, this is, again, remember, these are people that have been wandering around. God has rescued them. Anybody who has positioned themselves as a threat God has basically delivered his people and wiped them out. So the nation of Israel is starting to get a reputation of these are God's people. He made a covenant with them. He says, you will be my people. I will be your God. And he's doing miraculous things in and around them all the time. So we're going to pick up here in verse 4, and it says, From Mount Hor they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on their way. Let's just stop right there with that word impatient. 
How many of you consider yourself to be a patient person? Patient. Not sometimes. Me, not often. And if you talk to my staff or my family or those of you who know me, I tend a lot of times to be very impatient. And I think sometimes we can read these stories and think, what is wrong with the Israelites? How could they be so dull? How could they see all these miraculous signs and still be impatient or grumble? So they grow impatient. And the thing I want to talk about is impatience is actually the birthplace of sin. Because what does impatience do? It basically tacks a lot of the attributes and the very character of God. Because in your impatience, what are you saying? You're saying, one, you don't know what you're doing. Because if you knew what you were doing, I wouldn't be having to go through this. I wouldn't be walking through this wilderness right now. And they're like, God, when are you going to do something good for me? Even though he's already done all these things. But their impatience drives them to start to question and even attack the character of God. I'm impatient. I don't want to be in this wilderness. Why aren't you providing for me? Do you even know what's going on? So it attacks his omniscience. Do you have the power to get me out of this situation? I'm starting to doubt it. So it attacks his omnipotence. Are you even with me, God? So it starts to attack his omnipresence. And everything that he's taught the people, they start to grow very impatient. And sin starts in the mind and in the heart, our flesh. Don't ever follow your heart. I know that's what Disney and the world would tell you. Just follow your heart. Don't. The Bible says the heart is full of all kinds of wickedness. Follow Christ's heart. When he invades your life and he starts to mold and change your heart, follow that. Follow the word of God. Do not follow your heart. But so this impatience, it's At first, it just starts with these thoughts, these doubts. And then what happens in verse 5? This is what happens to all of us when we're impatient about a particular situation. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, there is no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Now, their attitude of impatience The idea of sin actually becomes sin. It becomes action. And what do they do? It starts in the mind, it starts in the heart, and then they speak out against God, which is sin. That is sinful to do. It's not even fair what they're saying. They're like, you brought us to this wilderness, and we don't have any food or water, and we hate the food you're giving us. So they did have food. And they did have water, and God had been providing. They just didn't like the way that he was providing. I don't know about you, but when I'm impatient and I start to feel it, that's exactly what's going on in my heart. God is providing for me. He has provided for me. He continues to do everything I need, but I want to complain because it's not really what I think I need. And isn't that the exact same thing going back to the cycle? Isn't that the same exact thing that was going on in the garden? Adam and Eve had everything. Paradise on earth. Everything. The only thing they didn't have was they thought God was holding out on them. And that's the lie the enemy used. He says, surely you won't die. You'll be like God. And that sounded very appealing to them. Oh, I can be God? And that's what the battle of our flesh is constantly saying. God's holding out on you. You could be God. But that's our flesh. And thankfully, he delivers us from that. So let's just go down a little further. So in group in verse 5, he said, they, they bicker and complain. They speak against Moses and God. Verse 6, I love it. As a father, I love this verse. And it seems almost petty because a lot of times I would discipline my children not out of a place of love, but almost out of anger or pettiness. You don't like what's going on? Well, let me show you what can happen. Oh, you don't like what your mother cooked for dinner? Well, you can go to bed hungry. You know, I mean, that kind of action. Well, that's kind of God and his loving provision. In verse 6, instead of saying, oh, sorry, I'll start providing for T-bones for you. 
every night. And Matt, or why don't we just get DoorDash and y'all can order whatever you want and we'll make it all comfortable so that you'll understand how much I love you, right? That's what they wanted. You're holding out on us, God. Why are you holding back on us? I know we've been disobedient. I know we've had lack of faith. I know this, but why are you holding out on us? They, don't, they can't put it together. So they start to bicker and complain and grumble against God. And what does he do in verse 6? I love this. In verse 6, then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the Israelites died. Oh, so you want to bicker and complain about the food and the water and the provision and the love and the covenant I've showed you? Well, then I'll just show you what it looks like for things to get a little worse. I'm going to turn up the heat a little bit. And this part is called correction or discipline, that God doesn't just cater to what our flesh wants. They wanted better food. They wanted more water. They wanted not to have to wander through the wilderness. But God says, no, you're going to. And now I'm going to teach you something really important. So he sends these fiery serpents. I looked up what is fiery serpents. There's a lot of commentary on that. A lot of crazy commentary too. But most people think it was, they were called fiery serpents because they were venomous and it would burn when they would bite you and they were red in color. Now there's all kind of mythological stuff that people read into fiery serpents, but that's what, that's where I've landed is, but it's not important. The point is, is God sends these serpents that are biting and killing people right in the midst of everything going on. He's like, oh, you want to grumble and complain, do you? You don't think that I'm omnipotent. You don't think that I know what I'm doing. You don't think that I can handle this situation. Let me show you what I could do. So these serpents start biting people and they start dying. And that seems pretty heinous, doesn't it? But just like in the cycle, there's correction. There's, and now we get back to provision. So the people, what does it do? It drives them to repentance. That's what God's correction does to us. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away these serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. First off, there's two things I want you to see there. They recognize their sin and they want to change, right? That's what God's discipline and correction does for us. Is God is far less consumed or um, about our comfort as he is the condition of our heart. He is willing to do really hard things that we don't always understand to draw us back to himself. So in this case, he sends these fiery serpents, these venomous snakes that are just biting people and killing people. And he's like, that drives them to say, oh my gosh, we sinned. We should have never said that about God. First thing is notice in their complaint, now, it has nothing to do with food or water. They don't go to Moses and say, please go pray to God on our behalf so that he'll bring us food and water like we asked. They just like, hey, we messed up. Tell him to take away these serpents. Give us, a, give us an escape here. We're sorry we should have never done that. The second thing is, isn't it interesting that the people come to Moses and Moses loses it actually in numbers. I mean, I can't imagine trying being Moses and leading these people around for, for 40 years. But Moses does lose it on one occasion during numbers. But so they go to Moses, they're like, hey, would you go to God and pray for us on our behalf? Moses is their intercessor, right? He's the one that has to go into the tent. He's the one that goes to God. He's the one that's speaking to God on their behalf because why? They're starting to understand the presence of God, but they don't have the relationship with God like you and I do today as followers of Christ, right? God's dwelling in the tent and Moses communicates on behalf of the people with God. And now what? God, Christ dwells in this tent. This earthly tent, God now dwells inside of us. And we no longer have to go to a priest or a prophet or anybody else to have access to God. We can go straight to God and say, hey, I know I'm sinning, 
but I need your presence in my life and I need you to help me in this situation. They don't, we no longer need that intercessor as Moses took that position. So that's just interesting. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So does God take away the serpents? He's like, okay, just kidding. I'm going to get rid of all the snakes. That's not the way he operates. He's trying to get his people to have more faith in who he is, to understand the provision. And he tells Moses, he's like, hey, I want you to do this crazy thing. And it almost seems like superstitious witchcraft, but it's not because it's of God. And he says, Moses, what I want you to do is take a bronze serpent, put it on a pole and put it in camp. And anybody who gets bit by a snake, if they look at that serpent, they will be healed and they will live. So he doesn't take away all the problems. He gives a rescue or a way out of the problems, right? So think about that. If you're a parent and you have a child that's in the tent, gets bit by a snake, all of a sudden you have a way to save your child where before it meant certain death. And it's just, look at that. God gave us that. Look at that in faith and you will be healed. And they kept it in the center of camp so that whoever got bit could quickly go look at this serpent and they would be healed. Let's read a little further. So Moses brought, made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole and, and the serpent bit anyone and they looked at it, the, um, the bronze serpent, they would live. So not only does God say do this, but it works. And people see this as a way of God's provision. They see this as a way of God saying, yes, I will rescue you in your times of desperation and need. You thought wandering through the wilderness without food and water was a challenge? Well, I'm going to step it up a little bit. And I'm going to make it life or death. And you're in your time of death. You're going to have to look at me in faith and trust that I can save you. And you will be saved and you will have life. Now, the reason I picked this story in particular out of numbers is because the whole Old Testament is what? Giving us a picture of Christ, right? Well, thousands of years later, Jesus comes onto the scene, right? And Jesus in John chapter 3, which is where we're going to spend the rest of our time today, is talking to a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was part of the Sanhedrin, I believe. He was really respected. He knew his stuff. What were the Pharisees? They were the people that knew the book of Leviticus, which Jonathan talked about last week or last couple weeks. They knew the book of Leviticus frontwards, backwards, and sideways. These were the master teachers of the law. So he knew the law of God quite perfectly. But what he didn't have was a relationship with God or he didn't understand the faith required. It was just going through a religious system to try to earn this, um, to earn their way to heaven rather than anything else. Well, Jesus comes onto the scene. And if you remember, everybody loved Jesus except the Pharisees, right? The people, the drunkards, the prostitutes, the beggars, the lepers, everybody that shouldn't, all the non-religious people love Jesus and his message because it was all a message of hope and faith and coming to him. But the Pharisees didn't like that at all because it was causing a ruckus. It was messing up their system, right? Well, Nicodemus is one of those guys, and he was one of the really smart, powerful ones. And we're going to pick up in verse 1 from chapter 3. Now there is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, let's stop there. First off, why do you think he goes at night? Didn't want, to see him. Didn't want anybody to see him. He's ashamed. He's kind of looking at Jesus and he's listening to the teachings and he's watching the miracles and it's got him totally confused because all these other Pharisees 
that have been living the law, following the rules really, really well, aren't doing the things that Jesus is doing. They're not healing lepers and giving blind people sight and raising people from the dead and all these signs. So Nicodemus is very, very confused. I have studied the law. I know the Torah and actually the entire Old Testament really, really well. But what he's saying, it doesn't match up with everything I've ever been taught. And isn't that what Jesus does? He shows up on the Sermon on the Mount and time and time again, he says, you have been told this. But I tell you, it's really like this. Or you've been taught this way, but I tell you there's a different way, a better way, my way. So Nicodemus, I think, is coming from a position of genuine curiosity, going, I, I, I can't reconcile this in my theology. I've been to seminary, basically, and I know all the right answers, the Bible answers, but you don't fit into my theology because you're doing things completely different. You're talking about crazy talk. We have the temple. That's where God is. We have the holy of holies. That's where God is. That's why when Jesus died and the veil ripped, it was such a big deal. Jesus is teaching a new way. So he goes at night and he says to him, Nicodemus said to him, how, um, oh, sorry, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he's, he's genuinely confused. Jesus is like, hey, there's a way to have a relationship with God, to be intimate with God, to have God call you his child and love you unconditionally. But that way requires that you be born again. And Nicodemus, being a practical guy, thinking all the rules and everything else, he's like, how is that even possible? How's a man supposed to crawl up into his mother's womb and be born again? That doesn't even make sense, Jesus. That's just crazy talk. What are you talking about? I think he kind of was being a little bit of a smart aleck here too. But I think he's just genuinely like, what do you mean you must be born again? Well, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say, unless you're born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Wow. Wow. He's like, this has nothing to do with a physical birth. Yes, we all have to be born of water, right? But this is a birth that comes from God. This is a spiritual rebirth. This is an idea that it's not just following rules, Nicodemus. This is something going on that God has to regenerate your heart. And he can only do that through faith. So God is calling you, and just like it says, the, you can't tell the wind where to blow. You can't tell the spirit what to do. He's going to find people. He's going to hunt you down, and he loves you enough that he's going to drag you, kicking and screaming, back to himself. And he's going to say, now, you must be born again, which is what? Your spirit saying, I can never be good enough. I can't follow the Levitical law good enough to be in a relationship with God. I can't do it. You can't do it. If you think somehow that the gospel of Jesus Christ is about, well, I'll do my part and God does his part, you've missed it altogether. It has to be 100%. I need to rely on Christ's work on the cross 100% alone. I need him to regenerate my spirit. I need him to bring me to life. I need him to come and be my friend when I'm walking through the wilderness. I need him alone to provide and give me everything that I need. Not the things I want, but the things I need, which most of all is a right relationship with God. And he does that through the spirit, through being born again, through that confession of faith. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? 
So Jesus is getting a little snarky too. I love it. Um, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. I have told... I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now listen, this is the cool part. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So he goes to Nicodemus. And he says, hey, I know Nicodemus knows the Torah really well. Matter of fact, at the bar mitzvah, the kids would have to recite the entire Torah, which probably took forever and is very impressive. But they would do that and they would be quizzed and they'd be questioned about the entire Old Testament. So he knows Nicodemus, this bright young Pharisee that's a ruler of the the Jewish people, knew the story of the bronze serpent, the one we just looked at before. And he says, just like those people. They had just received the Levitical law. God was starting to establish his presence in the camp and his presence among the people. But just as those people didn't get it until God did that, he says, you've got to look at me the same way that they looked at that bronze serpent in the wilderness. That is the only hope. That is the only thing that will give you life. That is the only thing that's going to be able to allow you to have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Is looking at that serpent, except now it's the sun on the cross, lifted up for our behalf. Isn't that exactly what we need to do? And that's what he's saying. Whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's that's it. That's the kicker. If you're walking through the wilderness right now, you can do one of two things. You can grumble and complain, woe is me. God, you're not being fair. God, you don't know what you're doing. God, you can't help me. God, where are you? And and those things, they're not... Their lack of faith, but they're not always inappropriate. When you read the Psalms, David says a lot of that a lot of the times. I think those are the feelings we really, really have. But the difference is now from the Israelites wandering through the wilderness is we have Christ in us. Christ has been lifted up for us. We're not walking through the wilderness alone trying to find out where God is. God is in us. And in those seasons of doubt, in those times when you're going through the wilderness, in those times where things just don't make sense and they're really, really hard, just like Larry was saying earlier, there's nothing that can be more difficult. I've not lost a child, but that's got to be top of the list. During those times, he could have just gotten angry and bitter and fled, grumbled and complained and wrote God off, or he can look to Jesus. You can look to the only one that can save you. You can finally throw your hands up and surrender and go, you know what? I can't do this. I absolutely cannot do this. But Jesus did. He did it perfectly for me. And he did that not because he tolerates you. He does that because he's madly in love with you in a way that we'll never understand, a holy love. I've said it before from this stage, but one of the worst things we can do is compare God's love to ours. Our love is so transactional, so temporary. Every relationship you're in, your spouse, your children, whoever, friends, it's transactional. There's things you can do that would damage or destroy that relationship or love. With God, that's not the case through Christ. Nothing you you can do will separate you from the love that God has for you through Christ if you're a believer sitting here today. Nothing. And that should bring us eternal hope and eternal joy. And then eventually, or right away, eternal life. You know, sometimes we think, I can't wait to get to heaven. Man, heaven's going to be amazing. No more pain, no more sickness, no more death. The gators won't be losing. 
Um, whatever it is, heaven's going to be terrific. But we forget that we're here now. And we have a purpose here now. And we don't have to wait. Yes, our relationship with God will be perfected and complete when we're glorified and in heaven with him. But you can start that today. Christ is in you today. When your flesh rises up and it starts to bicker and complain and grumble, stop. Don't be those kind of people. Don't be those Christians. But I've heard it said that most people don't come to Christ because of Christians. They look at us and we're just bickering, angry, closed-minded, unloving. I mean, if you ask the world what they think of Christians, the description is not a good picture. And it should be. We should look like Jesus more than anybody else. We should have an eternal joy knowing that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what happens in this world, we have eternity with God and we have Christ now. And that should sustain us no matter what wilderness you're walking through. And that's my challenge today is I don't know, there's a lot of people in this room, and I guarantee you there's people in this room that are right in the middle of it. And you're thinking there's no hope. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation. There's no way. But there is. Stop looking to your own strength. Look at the sun who's been lifted up just like the serpent and know that there's hope, there's salvation, there's rescue, there's deliverance, there's love, there's friendship. There's a father who wants to love you and engulf you in his love and tell you it's going to be okay. This wilderness is temporary, but eternity's eternal. And that's what Jesus does for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just thank you so much for the stories. I thank you.